Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you here today on our third, third day of the days we discover Barcelona. We're going to start our panel today a bit differently. Instead of academic discussions, what we're going to be doing is debate a bit the practice. So more than anything, we're going to focus on a specific part of sustainability, which is called the circular economy. And we're going to have three exquisite panelists from Barcelona speaking about their own experience with the circular economy. So I wish to warmly welcome you all today. And thank you for joining us in this early morning. So this is in the framework of Utopia, which is a network of universities. Um, we're going to be talking about a circular economy, uh, how to create a more sustainable world. This is first in the series of informing days that Ethiopia is going to be holding. And the next ones are following at the end of November with the University of Warwick. So if you're interested, you're welcome to join us there. Too. Um, so who is going to be presenting today? Let us just see why this is not working so greatly. Okay. Okay, here we go. So uh, I'm the moderator of the panel. My name is Lila Melon. Um, I am currently executive coordinator of the planetary well-being institutional framework at the Pompeo Fabra University. Otherwise, by profession, I'm a professor of corporate law um, and of economics focused on sustainability and sustainable development. Next in line, we have Zuzana Prosakova is a panelist from Pitch Architects, um, responsible for the research and development and innovation uh, department in the company. She's also a member of LITE's research team, as well as the research team of International University of Catalonia. Uh, she's representing also the certification of repairably repairable products. So welcome, Susanna. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Second in line, we have Marta Escamila who is at LITA Technological Center. Um, she's a sustainability division manager. She specialized in circular economy and the connected um, notions, which is life cycle assentment, eco-design, energy efficiency, waste and resource efficiency, and also environmental management. Um, and last but not least, we have Veronica Cucino, who is a founder of the company Symbiosi. She's a director with extensive experience advising strategic circular economy projects in municipalities, companies, and also in territorial entities. Um, by profession, she's an agricultural engineer, uh, combining her business activity with teaching and active participation in various fora, associations, working groups on circular economy, and industrial symbiosis across the Catalan, Spanish, and European territory. Welcome, all three. Welcome, thank you. Nice to have you here. Um, so how are we going to be doing this? Uh, I would kindly invite each of the three participants, maybe we start with Zuzana, to take 10 minutes to present their projects, basically their, their trajectory, the most important developments recently that they encountered um, you know, in connection with circular economy. Uh, after that, I will open a few questions for discussion and following hopefully with a lot of questions also from the participants, from the listeners of the panel. So, Zuzana, you can start and then we can continue with Marta and Veronica. Welcome. Thank you. Great. So, I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, ah, so it says me that I need to wait until you... Okay, and now I should be able to do that. Mm -mm -mm. This one. And... Okay, I should be able to see it. Okay, now. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so, well, thank you very much for inviting us to this um, interesting uh, meeting and event. Um, I would like to present to you uh, two projects that we have been working at or that we are working at uh, currently uh, that are very much related to the circular economy. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I represent here the whole team of uh, architects and uh, professionals uh, within our team, uh, which is around 20-25 uh, people, mostly architects, that are all committed to sustainability, which is the, the topic that has been very present here in the last 30 years that the studio has, has existed. 
uh, our philosophy within the studio is re really much oriented to what the circular economy actually defines and was like that even before the term circular economy came because well it's very recent uh, but all the topics that are included in like the energy uh, saving natural resources uh, health as well or, or biodiversity uh, we have been let's say in incorporating these uh, topics in our designs so first of the projects that I would like to talk about is the uh, Gonsi Socrates uh, circular. Uh, well, it's a, it's a new construction that has been done recently. It has been completed uh, just a few months ago. And uh, here I would like to say that uh, it was a collaboration uh, of the uh, promoter that already came with the idea to, to go uh, very strong with a very strong concept of circular economy. Uh, which is Gonsi, uh, then the construction company and related um, company of, co of consultants that were also helping a lot and uh, let's say provided the, the certification of cradle to cradle and, uh, and waste management that was also very important uh, to, to reach the circular economy goals. Uh, but I would like to talk here a little bit more about the architecture perspective, which is the one that, uh, that we have uh, taken to this project. So this was the idea of, of the of the project. is It is an office building with uh, also light industrial um, facilities that is to be rented by the promoter, um, which is also let's say um, well an important issue because the promoter is interested to always keep the building uh, within the uh, circular economy principles, so taking care of it and, and maintaining and keeping the uh, let's say the the control till the end of life let's say of the building and this is the result um so the the the, the principles that have been applied from the uh, architectural point of view are the uh, let's say versatility and flexibility of the building uh, universal access the health and well-being of the user so the user is always in the in the center of the um of the development or of the design and of course on the other hand the minimum uh, energy demand uh, and the uh, durability and recyclability of, of the or, or reusability of the materials that leads to the minimum environmental impact of the building so uh, the first thing that we have done uh, was to think okay so how we how we make that the building will last uh, as long as possible so th this uh, sorry so this is Oh, uh, this is something that can be achieved uh, by making the building flexible and, and adaptable to always uh, new uh, needs and requirements of the users. So one of the uh, approaches that we took was to make the building uh, with a large uh, open space. Uh, uh, here you can see the module of 10 by 10 meters. Uh, so it's a, it's a quite large span between the columns that allows uh, to, to introduce properly uh, uh, to start with the, the parking parking lots, but then create really large and open space that can be divided in different forms. Uh, and that really minimizes the material that is used uh, for the construction. So here you can see uh, three of the floors uh, that uh, with different excesses and different um, possibilities of how to divide the space. So it can be changed in, at any time. Uh, here is like uh, like uh, well how it looks like uh, so this is a, a prefabricated structure uh, based on well all prefabricated pieces which which also helps for the disassemblability of the building so it's another term that is very important and allows to reuse the elements uh, here you can see the it's all basically made, made of pieces so there is there is um, all dry construction uh, almost nothing has been done on site uh, in this building, um, so it means that it's really disassemblable. Uh, this is a picture from the construction. Uh, and here is another important issue that we have taken into account for the let's say, flexibility and adaptability of the internal space of the building, which are the installations, which are normally placed somewhere within the building, but in this case we have located them all uh, to the facade. Uh, so it also allows for very, uh, very easy division of the spaces and for, to, for adaptability to each new user. Uh, and then the, let's say, building becomes closed in this way. Uh, here you can also see that the, the facade is assembled by 
again by dry construction. So we have sandwich panels and uh, a, a, a metal sheet cladding that allows for very long distances between the supports. Uh, so again, we save material here and make it disassemblable. Uh, but of course, one of the most important things to make the building usable and to, uh, let's say, be, uh, be useful and keep its life uh, as long as possible is to, to allow for the comfort of the user so they, they will feel uh, comfortable and they will be healthy within this building. So there is a number of uh, passive strategies that, that we applied uh, from the typical ones like natural uh, illumination and natural ventilation. Uh, to, let's say, more sophisticated uh, approaches, uh, which will be more related then also to the active, um, active elements, uh, like renewable energies uh, and, uh, let's say, low uh, energy heating, uh, in order to, to assure that the strategies that we have proposed um, are, uh, let's say, suitable and that, that they work as we imagine. So we did a number of simulations. Uh, and this is then the result of the of the uh, well from of the interior space that allows uh, to the, to the uh, users not only to have a, a, a healthy space without um, any toxic uh, compounds or toxic uh, elements, but also with nice views, with also the always the uh, natural light and with optimum comfort conditions. And so here you can see also from the uh well from the exterior and this is the the building constructed as such so um well this is from the, this was a an an example of a new construction uh and also i would like to talk because this is also a very important issue uh in our cities which are already constructed a lot so there will be still more need of renovating the buildings so that's why we are participating in the European project, co project called uh, Drive Zero, uh, which is focused on circular renovation. Uh, so the circular renovation has basically uh, the same principles as uh, any circular economy action. Uh, in this case, uh, we are focusing on the, um, well, on the circles uh, like reusing and uh, recycling of the of the building components or using components that are disassemblable, uh, recyclable and reusable. Um, but also uh, in other, let's say, other pilot projects of this, of this um, well, Drive Zero project, we will have also using of natural uh, products, which are which is also an important uh, issue that uh, to talk about. Uh, so we would be let's say, uh, applying the strategy of urban mining. Uh, so it's uh, taking existing products or existing uh, construction systems from, from the buildings and applying it to the new building, the demonstrator, uh, but also uh, considering its reuse potential in the future. Uh, and as I mentioned, the bio-based materials is another concept that will be used in, in other of the pilot projects. Uh, this is the consortium, so you can see it's a really large uh, consortium of, of international partners that are all uh, collaborating uh, and trying to reach uh, the, the as much uh, circular renovation process as possible. Uh, and this is our pilot projects in the uh, Venti uh, Dosarroba network uh, and in the, let's say, Poblano area, where we are proposing to renovate the building with three aspects. Uh, first of all, we are trying to increase the comfort of the users uh, behind this Medianera wall. So it's, it's a it's wall that is opaque um, and it's not never going to be any construction in, in front of it. So we can, let's say, use it for this uh, reason uh, in the first place. The second objective is to, to uh, improve the quality of the urban space, also by uh, naturalization of the urban space, so introducing more greenery. Uh, which is the green wallet you can see at the bottom. And third, uh, third objective is to uh, create the um, uh, renewable energy sources, which are local. Uh, so they, there is no, let's say, losses between the uh, transmission of the energy and there is like more relation also between the user and the, the energy creation and demand. So these are the three, three main uh, aspects that we would like to introduce here. 
as well as uh, applying the circular economy principles uh, first to make everything disassemblable and that way uh, easily easy to maintain and easy to repair but also then to reuse or recycle at the end of life of the building uh, and also we would like uh, and this would be in collaboration with with symbiosi hopefully we can we can reach the but the application of the scrap store project that I'm sure uh, Veronica will explain later, where we would like to apply uh, rest waste materials uh, in the facade as the cladding material for this Medianera wall. So, uh, well, it's located in Pobleno, district uh, 22 Zarova, or 22 Ed. We have already created several options of, uh, of how to organize the different, um, different materials uh, on the facade. And we are going to collaborate with the, with the building users uh, to ask their opinion and uh, make a design workshop to understand their needs and uh, also their, their design, uh, well, how they would like their building to look like. So this is also very important, the collaboration. And also I would mention that, that we are creating this, pro, pro, uh, the, this project also in a very circular way from the point of view that we are collaborating with all the material providers, uh, all the installers and service providers. And we are talking about how to optimize the, the installation of this building. So the circularity in this is that we, uh, well, that is, there is a collaboration, very strong collaboration. Uh, okay, and the solar analysis has been done that has to be then implemented to make uh, the, the uh, installation of the photovoltaics more efficient. So there is always this energy efficiency topic as well, although this is already like, well, okay, that has to be taken on, into consideration, but we are introducing more topics. Uh, also, I would like to comment, well, these are the, uh, the providers and uh, consultants and support organizations that are part of our local team, uh, that we are very glad uh, to have them on board, that we will be collaborating with them uh, in the next three years, because the project has just started last year and will take still three more years. And that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Susanna. That was super interesting. I think I have a million questions just based on that, <laughs> but I will, I will pace myself and wait for the end. Um, so next one, Marta, you want to go and present a bit of your project? Yes, here I go. Perfect. Welcome. I'm going to explain the scrap store. No, 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 go ahead. Are you, you're okay, going to okay. it, isn't it? Because <laughs> uh, we said that I was going, just to, to make yes, yes. Uh, Okay, so now I'm going to, to explain you four projects that we are running in, in late act. Okay, so that you have a, a view of, we are, I'm going to explain two big European projects. Uh, oops, I think this is not working properly. Okay. Uh, the the first one is, is Houseful. Houseful is a is a big project uh, led by Leitat. And what we do is we've been working for two years and we still have two more to go to find innovative circular solutions for the housing sector. Okay, we have four demos, uh, two buildings here in Spain and two in Austria. And what we'll do is we have these uh, five items that you've got here. This is the, the, um, no, the, 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 kind, the time of solutions that, that we apply, for instance, in materials. We develop the material passport, so we know what kind of materials and components we have in the buildings. So when we do a renovation or at the end, you know, with the demolition, we know what we've got uh, in there. And, and also we promote the local uh, building materials, okay? In terms of, of water, for instance, uh, we recover the, the rain and we also do treatment to gray water so that we can reuse it. Uh, also, we work on, uh, on technologies in order to treat the black waters together with the organic waste so that we can get uh, energy out of that. In terms of waste, uh, we've got um, one of the pilots. Uh, we'll do compost, fertilizers. And in Sabadell, um, for example, there's a school next to the, the building that, that the, is going to be renovated. So this compost is going to be used uh, for the school so they can use it in, the, in their crops. And, and also we will focus on the, on the end of life. So once we've got this material passport, at the end we, we can do an, an, op, an optimal management of these materials and, and components. 
okay in terms of energy also we will work on energy um, efficiency okay passive and, and active solutions and also renewables no how to how to apply these renewable energies and then we've got this holistic part which is more like the no we do a bit of a of a zoom out of the all these solutions and and we will work here on the social engagement since most of the the renovation of the buildings are going to be done while people still live there because it's going to be all residential buildings so we are uh working on a co-creation event so we want the you know the the social engagement to be to be done until the since the beginning of the of the project and then we'll also develop a tool in order to measure the circularity so that uh constructors uh, architects owners whoever in the value chain of uh, of the construction sector can calculate the impact of applying these these circular solutions okay. Another project that we have is City Loops. This is a, a big one too, lead by ICLE. This is a 10 million um, euro project where these seven cities that you see here in the in the map are are going are performing their pilots. We started uh, last year, and what we are focusing here is like the how to become circular within the city municipality. Okay, so we will do this all these different. Um, pilots in these cities and the, the activities go from for instance uh, instruments for predicting the the ways that they are going to have in order to, so they can manage uh, more efficiently uh, from awareness campaigns also like 3d models in order to you know to simulate the impact of circular solutions so and but we'll focus on organic waste and construction and demolition waste okay uh, but the, the issue here is how the cities can implement these actions, then we will evaluate and test them, and then at the end it's going to be a replication. And in late chat, we're in charge of the replication plan of, of the project in order to you know, get all the lessons learned in all these cities so that others can, you know, can, can, we can engage them and, and we can replicate. And it's going to be a region here, Alvallès uh, Occidental, which is a Catalan region, where cities are going to participate in this, in this replication. Okay. And then, related to, to this, Alvallès Al Circular, it's a, it's a council of uh, 23 municipalities here in, in Catalonia and it's administration so it's public uh, administration and like five years uh, ago we started to work on circular economy it was a, an internal working group let's say um, built by the municipalities the, the council and but then also enterprises associations uh, research centers universities uh, some citizens representation and and what we did was try to work uh, on like helping these cities, but also the the enterprises and the you no know, and the companies of, of that cities to become more circular. And two years ago, uh, we established the platform, uh, this platform Valle Circular, which is um, a platform that is uh, formed by the five research uh, institutes of that territory. Okay, which are. Eurecat and Leitat, as we are the two research centers, and then also the universities, UAB, UPC, and ESTE, which are the, the three uh, universities of the territory. And here, uh, what we did was uh, try to, to help those enterprises that had, most of them don't even know what the circular economy is, so we train those or explain or inform about that. And the ones that already knew what it was, like they didn't know how to get, not to the maybe they had is some issues with uh, waste or energy related uh, or related to efficiency. So so we work with them, and then we develop some leaflets, sectorial like packaging, agro foods, pa um, also construction. So like the most important uh, sectors in the territory, so that we could explain them how to get more circular. We also developed some, um, uh, like a call feature for uh, different solutions so that they could learn and try to, to implement. 
and and this was uh, we've been doing this for the last two years. Okay, so we have uh, helped so many enterprises there. But the no the the thing that I wanted to to explain you here is that here the that we work together administration. Uh, research, uh, but also enterprises associations. So it is very important that we all work together in order to achieve you know, this circular economy. So it's not the enterprises by themselves, or it's not industry uh, walking alone, or, or, or it's not only the municipality wanting to change the city. Okay, so uh, this is very important. This network that we uh, built, you no, know, and how. No, this is why this is like a, a, a clock machine that we all need to to go on the no on the same side. And then the last the last project, last but not least, it's a it's a small project, but it's a seed to be a big uh, opportunity, which is the the scrap store at 22 Arroba. This is the a district in in Barcelona, and uh, the 22 Arroba network, which is the association of companies in that. District is um, is the the beneficiary, let's say, of this of this project, and we are working here together, Symbiosi and Leitat, to help them build this this scrap store. It's going to be a place where what we want is that all the scrap, so all the resources that people don't use anymore, that we used to call them waste, but they are not waste because somebody else can use it. So we want them to be reused. And, and here we already identified what are all these kind of sources that there are not only in Vintidosa Roba, also you know, in other parts of, of Catalonia, but here are some of the, of the products or uh, materials that have been already shared. Some, some other uh, industry already uses this, this scrap. But um, the thing here is that we, not, we are not only doing these interactions between industry, but we also open this to schools, designers, uh, art-related uh, artists, uh, maybe uh, neighbors, associations, schools, so that everybody can go to the scrap store and use all these scrap that, you know, that otherwise was going to a landfill or that they were just um, you know, like treating it like waste. So due to COVID, uh, we still don't have a, a physical point, okay? So uh, if everything goes uh, all right, uh, next month uh, during the, um, the European Week of Waste Preven Prevention, we will have like a pilot in, in the city center, in a, in a museum probably, so that everybody can see what kind of products and materials we, we already have so that they can uh, start using it. And, and as I said, this is the seed no, of a huge uh, opportunity to, no, to reuse all these materials that, that wasn't used at all. Okay. And that's it. Thank you very much. That was pretty much on point on time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marta. Um, it is really interesting to me that we all keep um, using the same term, saying like reuse, use until the end, don't waste. So there's no no more that um, recycling speech that used to be associated with circular economy, uh, which we try to also present to our students that recycling is not circular economy, using everything we have and reusing that circular. Uh, so thank you, Marta. And now we're left with Veronica. Our last presentation, and then we can start discussing some issues. Veronica, are you ready? Yes, super ready. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to talk about industrial symbiosis. That is what we are doing. No? And I always like to start with this picture. This picture is a forest. Huh? It's, it's obvious. In a forest, uh, there is no waste. All the energy comes from the sun. No, the more diverse the forest is, more the, the richest, the richer it is. It, it is. So um, if this functions and it's perfect, why don't we make our system work like a forest, like an ecosystem? Like, why don't we make our industries um, learn to share their resources just to be to, uh, totally efficient in the way that they are using the sources of the territory? And, 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 and this is the concept of an industrial symbiosis, hmm? where um, we 
identify the opportunities uh, between companies that uh, traditionally are, are very far away um, to cooperate through their spare resources, the resources that they are not using anymore, that for them are wastes. No? We, are, we are trying to identify those wastes that can be uh, 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 raw material to another companies and, 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 and learn the uh, uh, and try to teach the, the companies just how to do it. This is what an industrial symbiosis project is. It's like applying all the concepts of a circular economy, but not individually, company by company inside, but seeing the companies as a whole ecosystem. And not, and not only the companies, not only the producers, no? but the companies are also inside a, a, a bigger ecosystem. No? They are part, uh, they are connected with the cities, they are maybe using the water of a lake, they are uh, surrounded by a forest, there are agricultural uh, uh, activities, everything has to be connected. If we understand that the activities and the uh, uh, the, the, the improvements that we have to do inside an individual, inside a company, is not really efficient if it, we don't care also about the whole ecosystem and how we are related within. So, um, this is the way that we are approaching the, the, the industrial symbiosis projects, not only about uh, dealing with the companies that are the focus, of course, because we see that, that companies are the engine of the economy. So we have to just teach them how to, to, to be efficient, but uh, uh, showing them how to uh, collaborate, that this is the secret of all the matter, yeah? How to collaborate. We cannot do the things individually anymore. And this is a, a matter of, uh, it's, it's more cultural than, than, than anything else. So it's, uh, we, we, we didn't teach that the only, the thing that mattered was to produce the more and the cheapest. This is the way that we've learned how to, to, to do our economy. And, 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 this, and now we have to, 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 to learn again how to change this way of, of, we don't have to produce the more, we have to produce the best to maintain the value of all the resources that we are using. So we don't have to lose any of the resources that we don't have. So we, we change the way that we are producing and consuming, and that's why we need the whole ecosystem, uh, everybody working together, there will be no, and it's, it's the only way you know, to, to help our system to learn that cooperation, collaboration is the only way that uh, this, this new economy has to be implemented. No? Um, this is a, uh, it's, it's a cultural thing, I said before, so it's a long-term uh, issue. We cannot expect to implement uh, all these things uh, from one day to another. Uh, it's not a matter of fact that we have all the technologies and we are developing them very fast, but you cannot put that new technology inside the economy and, 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 and expect that the people just will use it as, well, oh, come, come, a new technology, you know, like it's, it's wonderful. I'm going to change my, my model of life from one day to another. So it's a cultural thing. We have to learn how to do it. It has to be a long term. Now, I always say that the, the circular economy is like a train that now is going slowly so that people, companies just go jump in. Hmm? But once that train has enough passengers, it would speed up. And then who is in will be in, who is out will stay and maybe die. So I would say don't lose the train of the circular economy. That's it, I finished. <laughs> I've been fast, isn't it? <laughs> You've been very fast and <laughs> very efficient. Thank you very much. Um, but very interesting and a lot of notions that we can debate and discuss in there. Very, very important. Uh, so thank you very, very much, Veronica. You're welcome. Um, now, in terms of where we're at, uh, we're going to start posing questions from my side and start hopefully a heated discussion that brings in some new, better questions. Um, and after we answer those questions, then we're going to open the floor also for our participants. So whoever is watching this conference, if you already have questions regarding the project or regarding the circular economy in general, you can start tweeting them and we will be answering them here. So let's start with something a little bit provocative, but just to warm up. So my first question to all the panelists would be, 
in your experience, what has been the most challenging aspect of your circular projects? So engaging in circularity, what has proved to be the most challenging across projects and across approaches? You can go as you wish. The floor is open for any comments. Well, since I have the microphone open, <laughs> um, I, the, the most challenge is the to, to change the way, well, the cultural thing, as I said before, and a co how to make people to collaborate, how to okay. make companies to trust each other uh, and to change the way that they do business between them. This is the most challenging thing, to sit them in a table and, 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 and um, uh, show them that sharing information no, sharing the, your initi their initiatives, it would be the, the, a more impact initiatives, and the way, it would be the way that it could be happen. They could be happen, no? happening. This is for, at least for in, in my in my field. No? Yeah, I would just briefly comment on that. Um, just add one little line. Um, companies are sometimes afraid of it also because of the legal framework. So it's not just kind of their responsibility, but the, the bigger the company is, the more they want to engage in discussions on circularity, the more afraid they are of penalties from the side of competition law. So if they're in the same industry and in the same branch, um, there are limiting rules right now that serve the traditional economy more than the circular economy, preventing new methods to develop. It is true that the reluctance can come also from the side of the companies themselves, but sometimes the legal framework is not helping either. Um, of course, everything has to, when we have to uh, talk about uh, cultural changes, it's not only in the economical sector, it has to be also in the public sector. Everyone has to go together, no? and the consumer sector. Every, everything, the three things have to go. But like I also say that sometimes we found some companies that are competitors in between them, but are competitors in the product, nor in their waste. Right. So just yeah. collaborate in their waste. No, come on, let's do the things together. But also in the project sometimes, like I think especially in the construction sector, there is a very little transparency. So let's say the tradition is that everybody is just closing their uh, information and doesn't want to share. And even like the information sometimes doesn't exist at all. Like mm, I, I have the impression that many times no one actually controls how much is spent and how, how is it spent and what caused the delays. And there's like very little information in this. And then sharing that, like it's impossible to get to let's say, to, to, to have useful information, for example. So I think this is, this is also one of the parts. And then to the legal frame, framework also, uh, in some cases, and I think this is logical and has to be worked at, that uh, the framework, the legal framework is missing, for example, for the reusing of the materials, because there is like no way established how you should do that. So of course, there is also some reluctancy to that, uh, to go like with any innovation or anything new, that if you don't have an established process, how to do that, then you are risking kind of. Totally agree. And in our project, we work on new technologies or sometimes we adapt uh, existing technologies, but the biggest challenge is always in the non-technological barriers. So related to legal issues, as you said, but also no uh, cultural. So that, uh, that the, the enterprises you know, are not quite uh, agree on that, although the technological the technology works. You no, know? so it's like and also the, the the systemic approach that we were saying that if we only look inside our house, this might not be working. But if we look uh, and we see that there are other agents that can also um, participate in that in that process, then it works for everyone. So. The non-technological barriers are kind yeah. of struggling in, in... So basically the, the change of mentality is the most um, challenging issue. I must tell you, like, also aside from the industries and the practice, the corporate practices, also in the side of higher education and inside of legal frameworks and approaches, it's the same thing. Um, the change in mentality is a very, very big jump from the way we used to do things and the way we should do things under the current circumstances. Um, and we're not adapting really well. So that strain uh, that Veronica showed us is, is really what is happening, right? Um, it is very, very difficult to grasp. Um, Okay, so it's, it's basically the same challenges that we're, that we're encountering across different disciplines. Um, now, aside from being in, environmentally conscious, right, um, circularity has been named many, many times as promising also in terms of social sustainability, 
there were claims that it kind of holds a promise of creating new vacancies, new jobs, new opportunities, right? Which is specifically appealing right now in the times of COVID when our whole system is kind of changing involuntarily also, right? So what would be your experience with this transformation from the linear way of doing things to circular economy? Does it really create new jobs or it kind of merely it requires re-education and formation of already existing for workforce. I would start with that and then we can elaborate on that. So does it create new positions on the top of what already is or it demands just the transformation of what already is? What was your experience? I think both options are correct. For instance, in the scrap store, a new job is going to be created. No, it's going to need a scrap manager, for instance. But with the other projects, sometimes uh, it's just adaptation of already existing jobs that new that need to do, like new no? new tasks, let's say. And also something else that uh, in, within these projects, we always do an environmental assessment in order to quantify the, the environmental uh, benefits of the project, but also social and economic assessment. And sometimes, uh, there are social benefits that are not always job creation. So we have some other uh, social benefits. You now, for instance, in, in city groups and, and household, like the, the household are going to be uh, happier maybe or really engaged because they are going to have other benefits that are not, nothing to do with the job, but, uh, but they also have these you know, this benefits from, from that. So this is also important. It's true. It's always not not always job creation. There are many, many other social aspects that will come into play for sure. Uh, I would say to this also that uh, actually until now, mo most of the economy or production has been like material intensive and the circular economy takes it to labor intensive. So there would be a lot more processes and actions to be done. Like if you if you imagine the reusing, the recycling, you are working with the same material but there has to be done this service. So you have to put a new service, new companies have to be created. This could be small new companies that allow, let's say, more social uh, balance. So there is a lot of, I think there is a lot to happen still in these terms. And I, I really think and agree that this will bring new job opportunities for people, people and let's say good job opportunities, not to let's say work for large companies, but let's say give them the power to also, uh, let's say, create some new companies. Uh, I, I would uh, add uh, that there, are, there would be some specific new jobs, no? And we will need a bunch of those new jobs that are the facilitators, the people that, has to, that have to be with transfer uh, uh, minding uh, of the whole concept of the business or the company of the project. Um, until now, all the, all the professionals, no? were tended to be very, very specific, very, very experts in one, one thing. No? Now we are needed people that has to learn, no, a little bit of everything, but the whole thing. And, have to, and, the, and we need people to be creative and we need people to be active uh, and, and, and engaging other people. And these are things that we forgot to, 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 to teach anymore. We, we, we just took it out from the, from the um, educational framework, no? And we have to put them again, because we will need people just to know, not to be very specific, but to be, uh, know a little bit of everything and have a general vision, a systemic vision. And this is why we are calling the, the, the facilitators. In fact, now we have a, a European project ongoing uh, that we are defining, designing the new profile, the, the, the competences that the new profile of circular economy would, would need. No? What are the competences that this type of, of professional, new professionals would need? Because we are not creating these types of pre uh, professionals in our society anymore. Hmm? It's, it's the problem of engagement, but also the problem of interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity. So that is something that um, higher education institutions are having trouble with right now, because there is a big jump, like you have an industrial jump from the linear economy to circular. There is a big jump in the mentality and the way we're teaching our students also in terms of academia. So the separate science sections and faculties don't do it anymore, not for the new world, not for the circular economy and sustainability. And it is, it is a channel, it is a challenge also from that side. So, so I agree completely um, on, on that point. Do you, 
in your experience with your project, have a feeling that people are, are willing to learn, are willing to change. So once they have the information, because the initial information, according to my experience across the years, the initial information is kind of the, the, the most difficult thing to, to get out, right? The, the proper education on what circularity is and how it should be approached. So that, that is kind of the most difficult task to get it across. But once you get it across, did you have a feeling dealing professionally with people that people are engaged? that people do jump on that train, if I use your words, Veronica, or, or are they reluctant uh, to, to embrace the change? The question is open to the floor, right? So, so any of three of you can, can put a thought on that. I would say that uh, it's a very sexy uh, sector. <laughs> so uh, I would say that there are very little people wouldn't just uh, get in touch and, and, and really, really, you know, um, like all these things that circular economy is, is, you know, is talking about. Uh, the other thing is that they can do the jobs that circular economy need because we need competences that some of them, you cannot learn them. It has to be personal uh, and, and not everybody can, well, like everything, huh? not everybody can, can fit in, in all the jobs. So. Uh, yeah. But if you have to be multi, 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 everything, multi sector, <laughs> multi people, multi company, huh? you well, need to yeah. be, you have to have some, some qualities that you cannot learn. Eh? You, can, you can learn the technical things, but there are some abilities that you have to have. You can, you can show also the abilities, eh? but you have to have a, a, a basis. No? But I think that everybody says, I like this, I'm engaged with this. No? But I guess it's like a puzzle, if I can just come back to that and then open the floor to the, to the two participants. But I guess it's like a puzzle, right? So I guess only the ones who are forwarding as the leaders, those projects and those approaches need to have this multi-inter everything. Then you start building puzzles, right? So you start building a pyramid and you need a particular um, competence and a particular part, and then it's enough to just be engaged in that part. So I guess this starting point requires people to be super talented, super engaged, super personal. But once you mount the pyramid, in my experience, you just need the pieces. And then it's again up to the people who see the clear picture to, to find the pieces. But people can serve circular economy by being also super specialized. It's just we need people who mount the good pyramid first and then use the specialized competences. To build it and to maintain it. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> That's the next are, step. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there, we will always need this, this multi everything people just to you maintain it, just keeping together. Yeah, we always need the director of the orchestra because if not, even if you have to say in thousands of hours, if there is an under director, poof, nothing. Exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't it's realize. the facilitator. No? Improve it. After the maintenance, we want to improve it. No, so mm. it's yeah. Now we're going five steps ahead. Yes. <laughs> That's what happens, no? because at the beginning it's like, okay, I like the circular economy, I jump in, but okay, once you've got like the diagnosis, like we need to really, uh, no, get the things done. So that's maybe, you know, like the more uh, challenging part. Yeah. We know what it is, but we really need to implement that. Mm -hmm. But actually, I was quite amazed how, how fast went this whole thing with the circular economy, because I remember just like a few years ago when the Ellen MacArthur, uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation appeared and they started to talk about this and make the, their mm -hmm. first publications and so on. And it was like amazing, like, wow, what the structured content and how much sales does it make? does it make and so on. And then suddenly we are having like circular economy action plan in the European uh, Commission or the European Union and like everything is moving in that direction. Um, I have to say I'm quite amazed by this, like how, how strong will it, it has become. Yeah. In terms of international obligations, for sure also, because European Union in those years undertook some uh, very heavy international obligations which require change of policies, right? Uh, but I noticed the same. I, I noticed in my profession the same, that when I started speaking about sustainability in corporate law, it was kind of seen like this side thing that doesn't have any weight and that kind of shouldn't have to do anything with corporations or corporate law in general. It shouldn't be an obligation. It should be something voluntary that some of the companies do, right? And in three years since I started that, it kind of became a complete debate on obligations and that it needs to be done. So it is, it is surprising how fast it is. But here I will go back to Marta, what she says. The problem here is the policies are, they are mounted, but they're very in their initial stage. So we need a lot of improvement to achieve what we were trying to say. Um, 
So I, I would leave it at that regarding the policies, but it's true that there is a lot more speaking about it, which also at the end of the day brings about better results, that's for sure. Uh, because up until the day we, we had debates five years ago that were very non-constructive and now the debates are very technical and, and constructive and going in the right direction. Building on that, um, it's not only the engagement and the personal approach and the development of the project that, that seems to be an issue regarding circular economy. There's been a broad debate in the European space and globally regarding the, in particular, the difficulty in financing circular economy projects under the current financial system adapted to the linear economy, of course. Um, what are your experiences regarding the financing of such projects? Well, in our case, uh, as I said, the first two projects, for instance, were financed, co-financed by the European Commission. The European Commission has already you know, uh, a, a huge back, I said, of uh, diff different uh, research projects and different topics. And there's a transversal, uh, so circular economy, it's transversal now. And this year with the European Green Deal, uh, I don't know if you've heard about, but there, it's going to be like 980 million euros and it all has something it, it's related to circular economy like all the different topics they have something to do with no getting uh no better in terms of uh, sustainability so there are, there's a lot of money in that but that is for uh research and innovation actions okay and also for for smes for them to start in this transition to a circular economy. Um, and then here we've got in, in Spain and in Catalonia, we also have, oh, obvious it's not that amount of money, but there are initiatives from the government to, to find co-finance smaller projects. Uh, for instance, the, um, the scrap store, it's a, it's a project co-financed by the, the Catalan uh, Agency of, of Waste. Okay, so it's a small amount of money, but at least it's something for the industries to start work on that. That's for sure. The impetus, the public impetus is there. My, my issue is more with the, the private financing that you need after that. So it means it is very important, of course, to have the means to start the project. But more importantly, like we commented before, and you and Veronica and Susanna, is to follow up with the project, meaning you can mount it, but it needs a sufficient amount of funds, first of all, to keep on its feet, and second of all, to develop. So even the money right now for keeping on the feet from the private sector, it is very difficult in a way to obtain scholar scholars have argued for it companies are complaining about it so it's like yes public funds are available to mount something but when you're trying to keep it going the private sector seems to be reluctant have you encountered any difficulties with financing after the initial stage um circular economy means new new business uh when there is a new business, new way of collaborating, new way of doing money, uh, there is a lot of risks. And I think it's a matter of risks, you know, like in the, the investment sector is very, very caution because the, the risks are, are very high. So what we need is to load down those risks. And the way to load down those risks is that maybe um, the, pub, the public sector to get involved in, yes. the, in the investments. No, at least the first ones, or, or, the, or the ones that require the more basic infrastructure that, that for the business needs to, 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 to develop. No? So I think it's a matter of, of, of lowering down the risks and making more public-private collaboration. Yeah, that, that sounds like that would be helpful because in, uh, in our experience also in, in the projects that involve circular economy, actually, they are mostly in terms of, okay, we are making a prototype, no? So we are trying something. Uh, so it, it's like one, only one time. And it's like, okay, it could work like this, but then it, it uh, let's say the continuation of that is not very clear because let's say the industrial partners say, okay, so the, the market is not ready for that. And they are probably right. So uh, it's like really a high risk. And as Veronica says, we have to somehow manage to uh, well, to show these industrial partners, uh, I'm speaking now, let's say, for the construction industry and the producers who have to be really engaged in this, right? So, for example, they being responsible for their products, so this, uh, this concept product as a service, and also le leasing yeah. the product. 
so yeah, this I think uh, well, it's it's complicated to happen. It's it's starting with smaller things like carpet, for example. Uh, the, there there are many examples of of companies that would lease you a carpet, but it's not 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 happening with, for example, uh, prefab construction yet because those are let's say more risky, bigger things. Yes, most definitely. Well, I would have a qu quick comment on that because it's not always just about the financial sector or the business sector. The fact is also that when you look at, take a look at the policies that are supporting the development, it's like they are not portraying risks appropriately. So the, the policy frameworks and the legal rules are changing so fastly, also in terms of um, energy efficiency, etc., the efficiency of materials. There's a lot of supporting legislation right now that presents a big risk for unsustainable companies a non-circular project because it's going to cost more at the end. They're just not embedded in the system. So I don't, I don't think that there is so much as that these project, projects are risky. I just think that there is incoherence into incorporating the risk of the traditional projects the way it is right now. So what we're doing right now in the financial system, in my opinion, is we're taking into account <laughs> the risk as they were six years ago when there was not so much energy efficiency legislation, waste management legislation, all, at all costs, the companies. But it's not implemented in the risk assessment of the financial institutions. So there's a big mismatch, I think, between those, more than the fact that, yes, of course, circularity as a new concept is risky. But it is still yet to be seen if, if that much more risky than traditional projects under the legislation as it is right now. So I think it's a broader debate that we just kind of don't grasp right now, specifically in times of COVID, right? Everybody's focused on the issue that is happening on the sanitary side, and we're not resolving the policy incoherence. But um, I agree that it's seen as risky, uh, but I think it shouldn't be seen as that risky right now in, in the current circumstances. Any comments still on, on this point no. on the financing side? But it's also more efficient. Yes. So yes. Yes. So more efficient and complying with the legislation that is and that is coming, <laughs> which is avoiding a huge risk, right? Um, but the market still somehow doesn't see it like that. It's it's a really interesting debate actually um, as to where we are. Um, now let's go a bit aside from from the politics and more into to personal responsibility, right? So I wanted to. I want to inquire you, what is your opinion, being in the field, being in the field of circular economy and sustainability, um, about the level of knowledge in our professional on one side, and on the other side, civil society on circular economy? And on the other hand, what could and should be done to raise awareness and encourage active engagement? But that I mean also on professional and personal level, to, to engage people in these concepts to kind of change the mentality, what we started the debate with, right? What is done? And what could be done? What is the level of awareness you think right now in a general society or the professional one? Who starts? <laughs> Who starts? <laughs> Have you think, are you- Okay, I will start. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Leila, sorry. Oh, go, go ahead, Veronica. <laughs> Uh, I would say that now, nowadays, uh, everybody has heard about circular economy. Everybody has a general knowledge about what it is, but the general knowledge. I think that, that, that mm, the real basis of the concept, the philosophical basis of the concept, that, that the ones that makes this cultural uh, change happen, sure. it hasn't come yet. So uh, I, I've, I've been uh, working with lots of companies that they say, wow, I'm doing a circular economy for years. And I'm applying it because they see that circular economy is like recycling and that's it. They do recycling and, and they're doing circular economy. And it's not that, you know, it goes much, 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 much further than that. You know, it's the basis of the changing this, the economic system. It's not like making recycling and making more efficient some, it's not making more efficient is being not creating impact. So that has to change completely the, the, the philosophical basis of the uh, um, uh, uh, economical models, the business model. And I think this is a little bit far. Now I'm going to ask you, how? <laughs> how? how train this is years and, and training and messages and working with, it's cultural. So I, I, it's, it's not comes from one day to another. You know, like, uh, I remember when, when the uh, helmet ob uh, obligatory to use in the motorbikes came, um, everybody was like saying, wow, this is like no way going motorbike with a, with a helmet, you know, it's not, that is not going with the motorbike. And it, after 10 years, 
10 years after, when you see a motorbike, a motorbiker without a helmet, you say, he's going to die. <laughs> sure. So this is the changes. If, if 10 years ago, you said, come on, you're killing me. And now it's, you're going to die if you're not dying. So this, and you need the 10 years. So I think that we need time. But Veronica, who bears the collective responsibility of doing so? In your opinion, it's just basically your opinion. Who bears the collective responsibility of doing so? Because somebody needs to lead the way, right? It's not going to happen on an individual level, somebody educating himself at home. Uh, people are busy surviving specifically in these days. Who bears um, responsibility? We are living in a society, and a society has a ruler. So uh, the, the, the less uh, responsibility is for our, our managers, no? our politicians are the men. But, but everybody has to be responsible everybody a, has to do it it's you know, a collective like, responsibility but what i'm trying to say is like the raising awareness i i believe that there should be some actors who lead the way um i think that sometimes in our discussions we give too much responsibility also to an individual consumer who is sometimes faced with choices that doesn't allow him to make it has to be, has to be the, leaders, the managers of our society yeah. but they have to they also have to learn you know yeah. their, their knowledge <laughs> about all these things is low so yeah. They still have to know. So we have to, everybody have to learn at the same time, but the ones that should know better are the ones that are leading, of course. Yeah. Well, yes. I, I actually don't agree with the, per, the first part that Veronica said that mostly everyone knows. No, see, I think that everybody, every day, more people knows about circular economy. I agree with that. No, because at the beginning we were like a uh, hundred people here in Catalonia, and now no, it's like because uh, you know at the beginning we were always the same, the same ones. But now um, lots of industry, lots of enterprises in governments, like they know more about that. But there is still a lot of people that circular economy doesn't mean anything for them. If you start talking about ways sustainability, they know about that but not like the circular economy concept mm -hmm. because we find like everyday enterprises or industries that oh yes i've heard about that but not really know what it is so uh no or in training courses so so there is still a lot uh to do mm -hmm. <clears throat> but a lot of people no gets knowing more uh, every day of course and then regarding the responsibility i think that it's also a matter of like everyone's but for the consumer of course like as a consumer we've got this power of decision but sometimes we don't have the information to decide correctly so uh a lot of enterprises are you no know, well using well the or like doing you no know, the, the, the right thing but some of the others there's the the greenwashing you know that we've heard about circular economy okay plastics are bad so I'm going to change the material of my product and I don't even know if it's better than the other one. But since I say no plastic or plastic free, I'm going to sell more products. So we still have this, um, uh, let's say, no, 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 it's not an, an opportunity anymore. So they are using it just to, to sell more. So, so we still need to, to, Watch, but the thing is that as a consumer, you cannot detect this greenwashing sometimes with information. I mean, no, maybe we three we we can detect that, but the, the, the customer cannot with the information that they have. So this is responsibility of the industries that are selling these products that they need you know, to offer this transparent and scientific based uh, information. So that the customer sometimes they they don't have at all, uh, which is the issue. That yeah. I mean, and of course, policy will help, but sometimes it's the excuse. No, that since there's nothing uh, mandatory, I yeah. want it. No, like of course, if it's mandatory, it's going to help, and no, this train is going to go faster. But yeah. even though if there's not mandatory, there are a lot of things you can do as an industry, as a provider, as a service. Uh, so, no, like everybody. Engaged, right? And it has to pay off for you. The problem of the market today, I feel is, it has to pay off for you. And sustainable practices, because the practices are so new and underdeveloped sometimes, uh, they don't pay off, at least not in short term. And everybody's living short term. And let's be honest, in the COVID situation, even more so. 
because there's a problem of liquidity, there's a problem of uncertainty, um, which unfortunately, without being an excuse, sometimes prevents brave practices and brave changes. So, yes, I would agree with sometimes you. Mm -hmm. something that is more sustainable, uh, it is not because of this systemic approach that we said, maybe we've got a product that the material no, we think it's more sustainable because it, we don't extract uh, virgin materials. But then if we don't have uh, the waste treatment so that we can recycle this, uh, it's it's not yes. worth it that we've changed our material. But no, like with the bio-based plastics, for instance, okay, uh, yeah, it's good if we can compose that. But if they get to the point, no, to the um, compost plant and it's never going to happen because nowadays, no, the, the, the treatment plants are how they are. So maybe uh, that's what we said no, at the beginning that it's very important to open and see how everything is going. So I'm, I'm cannot focus on my, no, in, in my house and see, okay, I'm going to change this. No, we need to think of the whole life cycle of this product. I wanted to actually comment in the same line that, um, let's say the circular economy is, is so complex that I think it's quite difficult for let's say a normal person to understand like what's actually going on because it's it's never so simple like here we really like how, how we compare whether one uh, there is one product that maybe has an impact to the um, to the environment because it has some toxic toxic substances but it's like perfectly recyclable perfectly reusable or another one that is like okay maybe bio-based uh, but it's uh, not going to be possible to reuse it anymore. So in order actually to understand which has which is worse and better, we should do like this whole life cycle assessment, uh, which is also not so easy again because there is a lot of information missing. Uh, so so it's very complex to evaluate actually. So there is people who who have heard of circular economy, but like understanding the whole concept, I think it's it's very complicated. So still there has to be a lot of uh, training to be done. And also in regards to the information for the consumers, um, I, I agree that it would be very helpful if there will be legislation, of course, that always helps. Uh, also sometimes legislation where there is a lot of lobbying and they're generally like from the uh, first intentions of how it should be, there is just like a small part that stays and that's not, not entirely helpful at the end either because you are getting like some information that is actually not saying anything. Uh, so there are also the third party certification systems. I think those are um, a nice solution. And many times this is coming from the, uh, let's say, non-profit sector, which makes it quite, um, well, transparent. And I think that it's, it's trustworthy. There is a book which is called Branded, uh, and it speaks about the revolution of certification in the last years. Uh, so there is like the FSC and other certifications that actually popped up and they really made a big a big turn in the industry like for the sustainable practices in some of the industries so that that may be uh, another let's say version or way how to get into there so another helpful tool to to get the circular economy in place i agree with you sometimes i just believe that um, the costs uh, related to those certifications are prohibited for smaller companies but that's another side effect then that kind of uh, comes from the system the way we have it but um yeah, it's useful because it's more transparent. Also, I believe that um, NGOs could be more helpful in naming and shaming. Um, They're doing a lot of work, um, but sometimes the biggest um, greenwashing practices escape them because they're so busy with other, other um, agendas. Um, for instance, when a pro producer, as it was said at the beginning, when a producer switches packaging, uh, I think Marta mentioned it, um, and they say, okay, we're trying to avoid plastics, so we're just going to go with cardboard. Um, there is a famous beauty product producer uh, in Europe who just kind of did that for the majority of their um, products and they made a commitment until the year 2022, I believe, to change all their plastics with cardboard. Um, nobody raises the question as to what that means for nature. It's actually worse. It is actually worse because that cardboard, if it contains creams, it can't be recycled because it has a line of plastic inside. That means you're killing even more trees just to portray a picture to the society that you're greener while you're actually doing worse. Because mm -hmm. um, plastic is more environmentally friendly in that case, which is crazy, but that's how it is. So I believe that the, the right amount and quality of information should come. I also believe, like you said, that um, policymakers are the ones who should lead the way. But I also believe that the engagement from the NGOs should be 
focused on on many more things than what they're doing right now because the environment is changing that much. So the scope and the environment of circular economy and sustainability and the practices of corporations are changing so much um, that they could help with the right information being disseminated. Um, that brings us to our current reality that we're living, so the pandemics. Um, in this current reality, are the conditions for circularity more encouraging or less encouraging than pre-COVID. What I mean by that is I'm referring first and foremost to the willingness of consumers on one hand and on companies on the other hand to engage in circularity due to the scarcity of resources, right? Um, or conversely, especially in Spain, um, the businesses closing down are worsening the issue of environmental and social sustainability or bettering the conditions. What do you think that this current situation did to circularity and, and, and sustainability? You see opportunities in it? or kind of impediments for, for further development? I would like to hear a bit more about your experience in your field. Mm -hmm. Well, I would be short in here. I would just say that uh, in our experience, the, let's say COVID really brought many difficulties in like developing new projects and the companies being open to try new things. So they just focus really on their core business and uh, try to keep that track. So just to try, try surviving. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, the ones that would close down, it brings new opportunities again for them so they can start differently. So yes, I, I, I would see the opportunities in that too. Me too. I mean, I'm an optimistic, although the situation, I'm always uh, optimistic, but I definitely, as we said, circular economies be more efficient. So using the resources more efficiently, so designing out ways, so it is an opportunity. And nowadays that uh, not outside everything, it's so bad, we really need to, to work inside and, no? and see it as, as an opportunity, definitely. I think it is also, like I always like to say, like rethink, for me, it's like the huge word of circular economy, not rethink, we need to rethink all that we're doing. What we're producing, manufacturing, buying, like, no, everybody in the value chain uh, can rethink the way that we are doing things. So now the moment. Let me, let me just pose you an additional question because you so nicely prepared it for me. Um, do you think that also in terms of individual consumers, is COVID allowing us for a chance to rethink? Or on the other hand, it's embedding us in, in kind of strengths due to the economic situation that makes us stop thinking further than from this day or paying bills or or do you think that it stops us in our tracks and makes us rethink what would be your opinion i think that it's the perfect time to stop and okay. think do i really need to buy all these things can i buy locally do i really need to to know to buy things from the other side of the world so even if there's uh no there's an economic uh no situation so this is the time so stop buying more than what we need and things like that so i think it is an opportunity for everyone um, i think that at a at a global uh, level uh, strategic and governmental and globally like an, a planet uh, COVID has put on the on the floor uh, the problem of sustainability, yeah. and everybody is talking that the that we urgent need a change. You know, uh, we've been talking for years about the climate change, and this pandemic uh, was put it again and, and reinforced the idea that we need a change urgently. Uh, at that level, it has been perfect. No, it had it had helped uh, because it put on, and everybody is talking about this, but. I think that individually, and I, when for individually, I mean as a, as a consumer or as a company, um, the urgent and short terms is the one that, that is, is, the, is the one that it's doing now. I mean that the first thing is to uh, eat today and to uh, survive for tomorrow. And this goes over the nice things that globally we see that are urgent and, 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 and needed to do. So at a global and, and a strategic uh, point of view, we see it and it's, it's on, on the floor and, and, and uh, as, um, mm, as popular as never has been, as ever has been. But individually, we are not able to put it because the short term is the, the one that's ruling the actions. So it's a, it's a, it's a mix, it's a mix, you know? I think that 
in fact, we have, a, it's like a boat, no, a big cruiser that it's, it's ongoing to stop it. It, you need a lot of time. You cannot stop a boat, and for and, no, you need hours just to stop it. And 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 this comes a little bit like this. No, it's a huge problem. Everybody sees it. We need a lot of things to do, and it's for a long time. But suddenly we have uh, economical problems. We have to survive for tomorrow, and then that's the matter. If you recycle, if you put a new matter of your con uh, uh, polluting, whatever, you know, have to survive. So this is the first thing. And it's, I think it's human. It's like a you know, uh, natural thing. It's survival instinct kicking in. Yeah. Survival mm -hmm. instinct kicking in. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I would add to that that I think that an issue like I would like to tie this into to the discussion that we all had about the cultural change that is needed and the awareness and the change of values. Um, it is not just us individuals that are pushed into that situation. I believe that the, the cultural point of view and the values are not changing also because of the mixed signals that we're getting from the top. So what you were speaking about the leaders, the point is we have recovery funds from the EU. We have recovery funds that are reaching uh, nation states. Um, they are not tied to real outcomes. And that was one big pitfall this year that a lot of scholars and professionals commented said, okay, you're releasing a big fund for recovery of COVID, but you know that you have a bigger wave of issues coming. So you should top that fund saying it can only be used in accordance with the objectives that you have or obligations that we have for against climate change in terms of environmental sustainability, in terms of social sustainability, but absolutely no conditions were posed. Um, Terrible. So the, the leadership sometimes also um, misses out opportunities in this um, struggle to survive um, and fails to embed broader issues into sustainability or better said to start understanding sustainability as the framework. So um, I would agree with you all. But have you seen any changes in terms of after COVID came regarding the engagement? People around you, professionally or personally, did they become more aware or less concerned? More Your aware. personal experience now, really. I would say more aware, all of them. Okay. A lot of and not really do the change because of the situation so that they, you know, as, as Veronica said, they need to do it today and tomorrow. So they are more aware, but they cannot do what they want. But a lot of uh, people have contacted us to do uh, projects that they haven't thought of it before COVID. And now they say, yes, we really need to be more efficient. We need to avoid uh, this kind of ways. So, so at least in... In my case, uh, a lot of uh, enterprises and industries uh, are definitely more aware. Mm -hmm. I would agree on that as well. I don't know if it's just part of the, let's say, the wheel that is still turning and is always more and more interest, uh, especially in the uh, construction sector that we can see that it's really coming. The, let's say, the circular economy in construction is becoming a term, so it starts to exist actually. Uh, and I don't know how much it has been actually influenced by, by the COVID, but uh, yes, also I could confirm that recently when we start to speak about, oh, and we could apply also the circular economy principles, so they are like, yes, and that, that was not happening before. Good result. Veronica? Yes, I think the awareness has rise. But um, the implementation of it, it's not so clear. Sometimes it depends on the, on the size of the company in my case. No, the, bigger, the bigger companies are already are, are doing, but the smaller, that are the majority, like, oh, you know this, I completely agree with you, but come to me some months after because I have to do some work, no? Like, mm -hmm. They're the struggling reality. with some other issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the good thing is that it arise, no, the, the awareness. So, and it, and also I think what what happened is just to sum up exactly what you the three of you said. What happened is this stop in our constant ways of profit. No matter if we're talking small company, big company, or if we're talking individual, it was just growth, 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 right? Mm -hmm. We could get more, we could buy more, we could see more. We it was a constant rise. Sometimes in. in in the, the case of individual, maybe the rise was small, but the rise of paycheck, a rise of opportunity here, it allowed us to take more and more and more. And we were so busy that taking more and more and more was fun. And then the COVID kind of stops you in your tracks. 
and it makes you think first of all do i need that more second of all there's no more because <laughs> there is a complete collapse for two months of everything so i think that break kind of helped raising the awareness it is true that i agree with veronica that implementation sometimes lags behind or let me rephrase a lot of times lags behind um but what i very much welcome is this shock in our lives that kind of make made companies in a way and consumers rethink um rethink their consumption patterns, rethink their production processes, rethink because the awareness came that this constant growth and selling more and more, it, it's an illusion. It can't continue and it won't. So we need to rethink what you're doing. So I think that's what's happening. And hopefully this train starts speeding up uh, once this crisis subsides a bit. Uh, that would be very nice. Okay, um, we used our time very well. So I would just like to address a nice open question for the end. Um, for all three of you. So now, sustainability is, is as a broader topic from, from the circular economy is known to represent a common global challenge, literally global from one part to, of the earth to the other. But the solutions, the sustainable solutions are often fine in local settings and they're adapted to local settings, which means all the sense in the world because also biodiversity is a local. Um, some issues regarding climate change are very much local. The, the support that we can do for sustainable po policies is local. Um, what would be your advice to our participants in today's panels, to the listeners, to help achieve a circular world? What could they do in the local settings? Where could they turn? What could they focus on? Well, I would say, first of all, inform themselves, right? So there is uh, a lot happening around. There are so many initiatives, like locally here, I think Barcelona or Catalonia is it's pretty much uh, innovative and aware. Like there is always, there has been always, the, the innovation term has been always here. I was amazed of that when I came. Uh, so there is a lot of things. So for example, uh, the scrap store or, or a place where you can repair your stuff or initiatives that are recollecting uh, old clothes or exchanges or, or markets that you can do a lot of stuff or uh, well uh, local agriculture that you can buy local pro local products so you, you support the local economy um, there is a lot of lot of initiatives that are that are happening and i think they are not yet so well known so i think it starts with the information i would say rethink like rethink Thing that you do or everything that you buy no and also do it in a collaborative way so work together with uh, other consumers industries no uh, administration depending upon the the case but uh, working together i think it's also one of the good things the concept of sharing right is is very important the concept of sharing and engaging like uh, we became extremely isolated which is serving the linear economy superbly um yes. but the circular economy way less right yeah um, think of others no yes 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 well i i really agree you know uh the only thing i would add is, add is that um every individual solution adds so it's a, it's a matter of doing things, doing small things. It doesn't matter. It's a good thing doing a small thing, no? Because the, the summary of very small things has a very big impact. So everybody should do something. Huh? You have to get informed to what, what can you do. But whatever, it's maybe it's changing your uh, um, uh, daily uh, uh, shopping, you know, or, or just being aware of, of the water that you're consuming or recycling a little bit more or whatever, you know, it's, very, it's a matter of doing very little activities, actions, and not only individually as a consumer, but also the companies, you know, as individuals, you know, can do little things, little implementations that help, and this the baby steps goes is uh, the needs gets to know so to be able to run when you are you are get uh, older no so baby steps whatever it is but they are also they're all summing hmm? but this that can be beautiful some summed up in in the fact that we all agree that awareness needs to be raised some steps no matter how small need to be taken and i would sum that up as saying we need to be conscious about what we're doing. So there is no more autopilot behavior, I believe. Um, that autopilot behavior that we were taught uh, should slowly stop. And I think that in this COVID situation, we have 
a beautiful opportunity to do so, uh, if nothing else, because we're majority of us is stuck working from home, which allows you to rethink the way you're doing things and you're not rushing around the city anymore, um, which is, I think, a beautiful starting point. So I would stop here and like to thank all three of you very much for this very engaging and interesting conversation. Uh, I wish all three of you a beautiful day. And thank you once again for joining us. This was very informative. Thank you very much. It was a nice. pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure is all mine. Now, finalizing this panel, what we are left to do is, I would like to introduce to you the next contribution. It's a video um, featuring our leader of the planetary well-being, Jose Luis Martí. Um, He's going to be explaining what planetary well-being is uh, and how we approach it. Uh, Jose Luis Martí is UPF Vice Rector for the Management of Innovation Projects. And in this particular video, he will give us the keys to understand what planetary well-being for the UPF actually is and why it is so important. Um, a reality that every day becomes more and more crucial to understand. Um, so I would like to introduce the video from Joseph Luis Marti. And thank you very much to our panelists. Bye. The Planetary Wellbeing Initiative is a transformative project that aims at transforming the university at three levels. The level of research, the level of teaching and academics, and the level of knowledge dissemination to the society. It's very important that researchers, as well as the students themselves, get involved in a new way of approaching problems. Uh, the concept of planetary well-being is very simple. Uh, all the problems that we face at the global level in our planet, they are interconnected. Uh, therefore, if we want to understand them, and if we want to find adequate solutions to them, we need to work also in an interdisciplinary way. We need to uh, combine all the knowledges, all the fields and disciplines that we have at the university. The Planetary Wellbeing Initiative expresses the commitment of Pompeu Fabra University, the UPF, as well as the network of Utopia with the SDGs, uh, the 17 SDGs goals, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This is our way of approach all these 17 goals that we have as a humankind and as a planet uh, with uh, the uh, idea and the belief that all these problems that we face together need uh, a combined approach and a combined methodology. Um, we hope that all the work you do uh, can be fruitful in developing this new, new way of approaching science and new way of approaching problems that can be useful and practical for everyone. Thank you. <laughs>